Rob Munoz is a principal engineer in Intel's design and engineering group located in Austin, Texas. His day job is architecture for custom semiconductor standard products targeted at wireless infrastructure. He joined Intel as part of Intel's acquisition of LSI Avago's networking business, where he was a distinguished engineer focused on architecture and systems engineering for the Axia and Payload Plus product families. I hope I pronounced those right. And he started his career at Bell Labs in Columbus, Ohio. So thank you, Rob. Okay, thanks very much for the introduction. So um, the work I'm gonna be presenting today is, uh, I'll be sharing, but it's a result of a collaborative effort with uh, uh, many of my colleagues at Intel, as well as some of our external partners. Uh, so flash up the legal disclaimers here that uh, our lawyers mandate, since as Yogi Bear observed, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. So speaking of predictions, as we saw earlier, Gordon Moore foreshadowed way back in his 1965 paper outlining, outlining Moore's law about the upcoming day of reckoning. Uh, and if we fast forward many years later, uh, we see that uh, more and more disclosed products are using a chiplet approach. Several of these from Intel that I've shown on the slide here with many more in development. Intel has publicly dis also disclosed uh, some of the associated enabling manufacturing and packaging technology. And this technology enables tiled construction of disaggregated or um, sometimes internally we call them virtually monolithic chips using tightly co-optimized chiplets that we've called tiles. Uh, so on the left, we see that Intel has used the chiplet approach for FPGAs, uh, so the Stratix 10 and Agile X uh, generations. So multiple generations of FPGAs and custom products have been able to leverage chiplets thanks to the open and well-defined standard die-to-die -die interface AIB that Intel has offered up to the community that is now uh, uh, Chips Alliance standard. And there's recently the AIB organic version has been uh, put up there as the latest version uh, there that's in the um, latest draft that's on the Chips Alliance GitHub site. So that supports both the advanced packaging and organic packaging type configurations. Uh, so in my day job, uh, building wireless infrastructure chips, we've been fortunate, uh, we've been an early adopter of this technology. Uh, we've used a chiplet approach that combines ASIC die with standard product die and custom package configurations. And in particular, we've been able to take advantage of chiplet-based FPGAs. So that has enabled a very nice continuum of solutions. Uh, chiplet-based FPGAs have, um, we can use the FPGA portion early on, and that allows a lot of changeability in terms of the logic customers deploy. And uh, later in the product lifecycle, we can migrate some or all of the associated logic to EASICs or structured ASICs and or fully hardened logic, which could be a mix of standard product and custom die, depending on how things have evolved, right? Because sometimes uh, we'll initially go out with something and then it will be standardized and it's reasonable to pull it into a standard product type die offering. Uh, so in, in general, there's growing use across multiple product families, uh, both within, within Intel and outside. Uh, it's useful to briefly review what do we want to get out of using chiplets. And some of this has been covered by the earlier speakers. We didn't really coordinate our presentations as folks can, can tell, I'm sure. Uh, so in theory, a chiplet approach should be able to get us lower portfolio costs. So both product and project costs, scale our innovation and delivery capabilities and reduce the time to solution. So the product cost uh, benefits as have already been uh, covered by several speakers, we can do bigger chips, construct bigger chips, including super reticle. We can get higher yields because we can use smaller individual die that we package together. Uh, we can uh, ship less wasted silicon because we can populate only that silicon that uh, customers want and are willing to pay for in any given configuration rather than ship a much bigger chip and have to turn off uh, a whole bunch of the functionality or make it dark silicon. Uh, we can better align the delivered IP to the optimal manufacturing process. Uh, so uh, that's kind of the essence of heterogeneous integration when the uh, associated process technologies used in the die are different. And there's, of course, other related heterogeneous integration benefits that some of the other speakers have covered. Um, 
especially important though is the notion of project costs. Uh, so we can do more configurations with fewer die developments. We can arrange uh, different configurations of chiplets uh, with different population options to achieve many different uh, chip product SKUs. Uh, there's the opportunity to do internal and external reuse with easier customization, reduced, reduce the porting expenses that otherwise would have required us to port IP to all the IP we use to a, a, the same process node like we might need to do with a monolithic design, that kind of thing. So in addition to the product and project cost aspects of things, it allows us to scale our innovation and delivery capabilities. Uh, we can more granularly leverage die and process locked IP from internal and external sources, both from a design and a manufacturing standpoint, as well as access the 3D stacking benefits, which include the uh, compared to a hypothetical 2D type alternative, get XY area reduction, and especially interesting is the ability to place memory closer to logic, which can be very important in terms of reducing the latency that, uh, you know, for things like caches and that kind of thing. Uh, likewise, ideally, we want to be able to reduce our time to solution. So, and for that, reuse is, of course, a really big lever. Uh, as well as we can reduce any kind of uncertainty about process availability or maturity in terms of yields, that kind of thing, as well as the IP porting schedule and ramp risks. So that's all well and good, uh, but there's no free lunch here. Uh, chiplets aren't a panacea. Uh, they're you know, very promising, of course, but it's important to manage the trade-offs that are associated uh, when you use them. So there's uh, tiling overheads, where you, in order to tile things together or use a chiplet approach, you need to have dotted eye interfaces. Those dotted eye interfaces themselves consume area and power. They can uh, cost extra performance versus a hypothetical monolithic integration alternative. And of course, it's not always feasible. That's all, not always a fair comparison to make because sometimes we're building things that you could never build monolithically because they're super reticle or you'd never get good yields on it, that kind of thing. But nonetheless, that is the area power and performance overhead for the die to die interface needs to be understood and factored in. Uh, there's also can be incremental package assembly and test costs and durations as well as tighter tolerance requirements. And in manufacturing, uh, time is money. And so if you impact the time it takes you to build things that can cost money, that can also make some of your inventory management more costly and complex. Uh, because uh, many times, uh, you know, I know Intel is very good as, as far as uh, we quote lead times that are shorter than our manufacturing time. And we bridge the gap by predicting what types of things are gonna be ordered when and pre-building uh, based on that. And so, the longer the manufacturing cycle times are, the more difficult that kind of prediction activity becomes and the more inventory we need to carry in order to uh, manage that. It's of course impractical to co-package multiple hot die together or die that each need a large amount of external PCB connectivity. So it's best to uh, package things where the, you take advantage of a strong degree of communication affinity between things that are in the same package and some manageable amount of uh, connectivity between uh, package devices. Uh, you also have to carefully manage thermals as uh, Jawad and others have mentioned. Uh, if you're integrating external die, like from um, uh, third-party partners and uh, that kind of thing. So HBM would be a, a notable current example. You have to worry about margin stacking and inventory carrying costs, right? Because if you're paying full price for the integrated chiplets and that margin needs to be stacked on whatever you're selling. So uh, that can be a concern sometimes. Uh, of course, chiplets aren't gonna be optimal in all cases. Um, they're in some types of products, there's a swingle, single sweet spot type configuration or some other high volume monolithic type thing might make the most sense. Like if you're producing some super high volume uh, consumer device, for example, maybe a uh, you know, mostly monolithic would be attractive for that if there's a single sweet spot type configuration for it. And of course, if you build building die for a 3D stack, it can be difficult to reuse those die in the stack and they can have additional thermal challenges. Of course, um, even with 3D, 
uh, it's you know very reasonable to have a 3D stack that you then have a well-defined interface to, and you integrate that much like we do with HBM. Um, so let Rob, me we had a, a question come up on sure. uh, what do you think is the percentage die area overhead uh, due to the additional interface requirements, uh, TSVs, other issues in 3D stacking? Yeah, so it, it can vary quite a bit. It's hard to give a you know one size fits all answer. I, I, you would ideally like to uh, reduce the overhead as much as you you can reasonably do, you know, you know, five, ten percent, you know, something like that. But you, you know, overhead needs to be measured along multiple dimensions. As mentioned earlier, there's area, performance, and power type uh, things, as well as other uh, complications that that can do. So it's hard to give a one size fits all answer. But of course, you want to make that as low as possible, and the lower you can make the overhead. And the better you can do your packaging assembly and test with high yield, the greater opportunities it gives you to use more smaller chiplets to give you a lot more flexibility during uh, final assembly with different configurations. Any other questions? So if not, I'll proceed here. Please. Oh. OK. So. Uh, in practice, though, I mean, we've, you know, there's been a lot of good work done, uh, you know, a lot of success, especially within company use. And at Intel, we've been very fortunate that we've had success both with uh, internal use as well as with customers and ecosystem partners producing compatible things that we can uh, achieve some degree of cooperation with. But in order to have this scale more broadly, there's some key prerequisites, and some of these have already been covered, but uh, not all of them. So one of the ones we haven't talked about as much uh, yesterday and today, but is critically important, is a volume attach point for chiplet-based products. So something that ships in high volume uh, so that there's enough of a uh, ecosystem pull, so to speak, from a marketplace demand to make it attractive. Because the key thing that sustains ecosystems our uh, network and learning effects. And so you need to enough, have enough scale to make that happen. Of course, as has been mentioned by some other speakers as well, which is very true, and we'll talk more about this in an upcoming slide, fully specified interface standards for the full chiplet. So more than the data interface, more than just the nominal protocol stack, but the full chiplet needs to be specified in, in enough uh, rigor so that you can make things that are interoperable. The, uh, enabling IP tools, uh, flows, methods, software, all those kinds of things. I don't think there's been that much discussion about software before, but that's very key here, as well as the ability to support these things on a broad market from a manufacturing, packaging, assembly, and test type capabilities. Okay, so lay the land as um, I would see it at least. Uh, there's some key uh, early volume ad adoption use cases that we would want to address here. So one of those would be layer one only connectivity, uh, such as shown on the left side, and that would be good for uh, in-package optical, which some speakers have mentioned, as well as for disaggregating CERTES. Uh, of course, while CERTES disaggregation is attractive, in-package optical is even more promising, and triplets have some significant advantages here because micro bumps together with um, micro bumps initially and hybrid bonding in the future, as uh, some folks have talked about, enable pretty low overhead IO escape off of each die and optical itself enables transmission of a huge amount of bandwidth over a distance. So in combination, this unlocks the uh, data center, HPC and AI type uh, opportunities. Uh, there's also a big potential for XPU attached. So by XPU, I mean CPU, GPU, IPU, those types of things, plus especially as applied to data center and edge applications. So the current dominant approach, as uh, Bobby kind of mentioned, uh, for board level integration uses PCIe evolving to CXL. Uh, so a practical way to bootstrap a chiplet ecosystem is just to swap out the CERTES used for an open die to die uh, chiplet interface such as AIB or AIB organic 
Um, and then if you can do that, you can kind of instantly get uh, some ecosystem carryover. So CXL in particular provides memory extension and pooling via the CXL.mem protocol. Uh, it supports coherent accelerator attached via the CXL.cache protocol. And this supplements the current PCIe load store type capabilities. So with CXL and PCIe compatible chiplets and separately packaged and potentially scaled up counterparts, you could ideally have a library of things that supports uh, chiplet based uh, instantiations of these things, as well as package devices you can use for board level configurations. You can create a lot of configuration variants using a small number of building blocks. Um, and in addition to this volume use case, of course, there's other protocols that are, are interesting, such as the AXI family uh, over the Dottida interface, as was mentioned earlier. And those are very important for FPGAs and other custom logic and, and that kind of thing. Uh, but observation is with the reuse we can get out of carrying over the board level ecosystem, that's really helpful for portfolio cost economics, which is something I alluded to earlier. So there's different versions of this chart uh, floating around. This is the one I grabbed from the IEEE heterogeneous integration roadmap that Bill Chen talked about earlier. Uh, but the observation is whether you believe these particular numbers or not, almost everyone's version of this curve shows that costs are skyrocketing to do uh, die designs for leading edge nodes. And fewer individual design and opportunities are gonna be large enough to amortize all these costs. And so the uh, only solution I can think of is reusing IP and die within and between chips to manage this mismatch. So I can use the same thing all over the place and amortize these costs over a bigger volume of product opportunity. And of course, reuse has a number of benefits uh, as well. So in addition to uh, allowing incorporation of innovation from third parties and partners, it can uh, benefit schedule and quality and enable uh, what uh, we can call a uniform edge to cloud experience. So if you can use a chiplet approach here, uh, you can flexibly populate, assemble uh, your chiplets in right sized configurations uh, based on the associated deployment environment you need to do. So you might have for a cloud solution, a deployment environment where you can have a point source or TDP type power dissipation of several hundred Watts. And for those environments, you might want to co-package CPUs, accelerators, and IO devices, uh, including optics that most benefit from the high bandwidth interconnect and low latency interconnect that you can do with chiplets and might separately package other clusters of processing acceleration IO so that um, uh, you can manage those port source thermal limits while taking advantage of the late attached capabilities that doing some of this with board level integration can provide. For an edge solution though, I might be a lot more space and power limited. Uh, for example, in my day job, we build radio solutions and base stations, and these need to be deployed at the tops of the cell phone tower or the bottom uh, in outdoor environments. And for edge solutions you know, like these at the far edge, I still wanna be able to use all of these underlying building blocks that I have uh, that I might wanna put in a cloud solution, but I, wanted, I need to be able to right size them for that deployment environment, the thermal constraints, cooling, uh, form factor, all those kind of things. And there's some great software benefits to um, an approach that uses the same building blocks over the, all over the place as well that we'll discuss in a later slide. So uh, I'll pause real quick, any questions before I um, jump into the interface discussion? Yeah, we did have one question on, is there a chiplet failure analysis ecosystem that's being developed with, with the advancement of chiplet technology and increased usage. Yeah, there's going to be a more work required in that area. I think there, some of that was discussed in yesterday's session as well, where it, if you have something that fails, uh, typically uh, you need to do some amount of diagnosis uh, in field and possibly pull the associated um, board or chip uh, off and send it back to the manufacturer for some kind of uh, analysis. And so uh, when you have a mix of chiplets that are integrated in package, that's going to 
make some aspects of that analysis more complicated, especially when you have multiple suppliers providing those things. So it's kind of like the same types, similar-ish challenges that you have for multi-vendor test support, but expanded to uh, you know after deployment type things where you can have failures that uh, come up uh, you know post deployment where it may have worked properly when you deployed it but it no longer works properly and um, just like with you know any other thing when you have even board level solutions when you have components from different vendors uh, talking to each other there can be some challenges in terms of narrowing down whose fault it is so to speak what's which is the failing component and with limited visibility into communication between components. Uh, it's going to be hard to put a bus analyzer on the uh, interface between chiplets. That's going to make it even more complicated. So this is where uh, support for uh, testability type capabilities is going to become really important to be able to better isolate and capture some of these uh, types of things so that you can better diagnose failures uh, from the field. So hopefully that made sense. Any other questions? That's all we've got so far. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So in order to be successful here, we need to have well-specified interfaces uh, that are architected uh, where, and Jawad actually identified a lot of the associated models that are needed for this. Uh, so mechanically, of course, you would need to specify bump and wire sizes, bonding footprint, XYZ constraints, the thermal, Thermal characteristics and associated thermal modeling has been pointed out in several of the presentations today and yesterday is really important. Electrical type things. Uh, functional, of course, every, everyone uh, it obviously would need to manage the uh, functional stuff, but a lot of times people don't think about, people think about the quote unquote made man type things, but they don't always consider the sideband things, the management, power security, debug, configuration statistics, manufacturing test access. So those kinds of things need to be adequately specified. Uh, you know, some of these things would need to be specified for interoperability. Other things just need to be specified for uh, you know, particular deployment uh, type cooperation. Uh, but nonetheless, they need to be thought through. It's a you know, more of a system type thing that's shrunk into the package scale integration. Uh, likewise, generational compatibility ideally needs to be supported so that I can take my previous generation chiplets and use them in my new generation design. And of course, all of this needs to be enabled by off the shelf tools, flows and methods, hardware software building blocks, because our goal at the end of the day is to uh, get to industry scale systematic reuse with, of which chiplets would be an important component, but not the only thing that would be important. Okay, so from a physical connectivity side, uh, this has already kind of been covered as well. Uh, the, from a packaging technology, there's several different packaging uh, choices that would you'd want to address. And IO technology, there's uh, uh, different philosophies which have different trade-offs as far as whether I have simple IO and many wires versus complex IO and few wires. Uh, and for to really capture the potential chiplets, as Jawad also pointed out and other speakers, uh, the many wire IO approach is best for unlocking the full potential of package level integration. Uh, and uh, something that was kind of alluded to, but is also worth mentioning here is that it's best to focus on the interfaces for 2D, 2.5D, 2.XD type things, because it's very challenging to fully specify 3D interfaces in a fully reusable fashion because of uh, thermal and power delivery type challenges that uh, Jawad mentioned. Okay, so uh, important to mention software again here. So when we do chiplets, you really want to think about software and system implications so you can deliver on the value proposition. So Ideally, we want a software model which is agnostic to whether the functionality is integrated on die, in package, or at the board level. And as discussed earlier, one promising way to do this is initially leverage uh, CXL and PCIe for, um, and use that for package level integration because we can then carry over all of the work that's been done for board level integration and uh, 
much more quickly get things uh, bootstrapped because that solves a lot of these challenges we'd rather have to uh, invent or specify. Uh, so to summarize here, a uh, triplet approach has tremendous potential, but there are some key adoption and scaling challenges we have to, or prerequisites that we need to address in order to provide all these benefits. Uh, so in addition to having well-defined standard interfaces for interoperability, we really need to get volume attach points to drive the associated network and learning effects. And IO and XPU attach are very promising use cases to help drive uh, the volume attach, as well as uh, ideally we would do something like carry over the PCIe and CXL ecosystem to support XPU attach to help jumpstart a broad ecosystem. And, and extra bonus there, which is really important, is can it can provide a nice reusable software model that it enables uniform cloud to edge solutions to be offered. And by addressing these prerequisites, uh, industry can reshape how companies can collaborate together to build many types of chips in the future. And that's my last slide. So thanks for your time and attention today. And I'm happy to take any further questions. Yeah, yeah we've got uh, one more question, which is in the current uh, global chip shortage environment, what applications do you foresee that have uh, you know, greater near future applicability? Uh, there's tremendous demand uh, for all kinds of uh, semiconductor things, so much so that there's a global semiconductor shortage. So there's tremendous opportunity all over the board. Um, you know, last night I was in a discussion with uh, some colleagues about uh, automotive opportunities, and I'm not necessarily saying that they, um, you know, that we have ready-made chiplet solutions for automotive stuff uh, right away. I'm just observing that there's tremendous demand all over the place, and uh, but as an earlier speaker or maybe multiple early speakers pointed out probably the early adoption uh, place to use chiplets would be uh, data center, HPC, AI type things, because then you can really take advantage of the uh, massive IO connectivity benefits that you can get. Uh, likewise, we would see the edge as a uh, very attractive place to adopt chiplets because you can use chiplets to provide a right sizable uniform cloud to edge solution. So those would be the newer term type things. So data center and edge, including HPC and AI type things. Uh, but of course, many other things are also potentially attractive in, in the future as we get more of the piece parts in place, including maybe even automotive as, we, as I just mentioned. Okay, thank you, Rob. Well, lastly, I'd like to thank once again, our sponsors, Adventist, Amcor and Synopsys who made this event possible. Um, Adventist uh, rated the best ATE company 2021 in the VLSI research uh, supplier uh, survey uh, for customer satisfaction. Uh, Amcor leading OSAT with differentiators in technology, quality and services. And Synopsys uh, providing solutions from silicon to software. So I uh, thank them. I thank all of you for attending and uh, look forward to seeing you at a future MEPTEC event uh, soon in person, but we'll also continue the virtual format because uh, it's great to have such a wide variety of speakers and attendees. So thank you all and have a good rest of your day.